Hello and welcome to another Nomen Industry event. <laughs> for those of you watching at home, if you're looking for closed captionings, go ahead and head over to our Facebook and our YouTube page. Uh, on top of that, we'd love to take a second to thank our sponsors, Dell and NVIDIA. Without them, we wouldn't be able to provide you with such amazing content as you're about to see tonight. Uh, along with that, if you have any questions for our presenters tonight, go ahead and leave them in the chat wherever you're watching, and then we'll be sure to try and get to them at the end. That being said, we are thrilled to welcome artists from Blizzard, Santa Monica Studio, and Riot Games who will discuss their career paths, current roles, and offer advice on getting started in the industry. This panel discussion will provide aspiring artists, so some in the uh, audience here tonight, uh, with an in-depth understanding of multifaceted roles of a technical artist. Now, I'm a little bit familiar with what technical art is and all the different facets. These folks that are here right now on stage, they're basically like Swiss Army Knives, and they work on some of my favorite stuff. I cannot wait to hear all about it. Please help me welcome our tech art panel. Hi, hello. Um, welcome, uh, hello fellow art enthusiasts to the world of uh, technical art across uh, various disciplines and within uh, diverse studios. Before I start, I'd like to extend my Heartfelt gratitude to the following incredible individuals, Lily's support and uh, dedication in organizing the event from the start to finish has been invaluable. Melissa and uh, Chris' clear guidance and assistance with social media resources make this Norman event a success. And a sp special shout out to our dear friend, Rambert, who connected us to Norman right from the beginning. This event wasn't uh, have been uh, possible without each and uh, every one of those individuals. Um, time to get to know our speakers. Each of uh, us brings a different experience to the table. Let's kick things off with a round of uh, introductions. Here's a sneak peek at my journey. I'm Yan, a VFX art lead at the Riot Games on League of Legends. And I'm uh, delighted to be here at Norman uh, with my experience in VFX and technical art within the game industry. I began as a concept artist in Shanghai, studied and worked in France, where I embarked a mixed discipline role, full-time VFX artist in Canada, then returned to Shanghai for more technical art excitement now serve as a VFX art lead for League of Legends in Los Angeles. We will explore more in my following sections about the VFX and the technical art. Now let me hand the mic over to my teammate, Jing. Oh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Jing Jing and uh, I'm the 25 technical artist in, in <laughs> And I work with Ian together in the Liga PC team. Um, so this presentation, I'm going to give you a taste of what a twin pipeline artist is. Um, so as you can see, like I was a, a game designer before I became a twin pipeline tech artist. So I hope for if you, if any of any of you like me, like want to translate your role into twin pipeline tech artist, or you are interested in it, I hope my presentation can. Help you a little bit. Yeah, thank you. And then let's go to the Hi, uh, my name is. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Junyang Zhang. Uh, so I'm a environment artist currently working at Blazer Entertainment um, on Diablo 4. So basically, uh, I joined Blazor two years ago. Uh, I was a, a technical artist working under another uh, game. It's called Source of the Wind. So I will be talking about this one a little bit later in detail. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Hello. Right. Hello. <coughs> My name is Ten Hao Wang, and uh, I'm a senior staff technical artist at Sony Santa Monica Studio. Uh, I graduated from the Carnegie Mellon University in 2016 
and join the Activision Hyman Studios and work on a God of War, uh, sorry, work on a Call of Duty Infinity Warfare. And after that, I joined the Visual Concept and work on multiple NBA 2K titles. And on uh, 2019, I joined uh, Santa Monica Studio and work on a God of War Ragnarok. All right, let's uh, get it started. Mm -hmm. One second. Uh, great. That's me uh, and my LinkedIn avatar. Uh, so those are my contacts. Uh, and uh, yes, allow me to share part of my career journey with you. I started my professional life as a concept artist in some studio like uh, Virtuous Games and Spicy Horse, where I had uh, the opportunity to contribute a couple of different genres of games. However, uh, my curiosity for further exploration on game development led me to France where I pursued a master degree at CNAM, a very old school originally founded during the French Revolution. During my time in France, uh, I started my cross-discipline journey, blending the worlds of uh, VFX and concept art. I also got a short internship as a programmer to prototype a game in Unity in a very small studio. This fusion of skills allowed me to bring a fresh perspective to game development. Uh, I continued my career uh, at Don't Know Studio, got my first mixed discipline job there. Uh, later, I was recruited by Ubisoft, where I took a full-time role in VFX. My experience and the journey then led me to Gearbox Software, where I had the privilege of working on the title Borderlands 3 and the three of the DLCs. My career took another turn as I joined the MiHoYo, HoYoVerse, when I returned to my hometown Shanghai, where I focused on the technical aspect of VFX. My role centered on optimizing process and uh, enhancing workflow efficiency of the dev team. And then I find myself at the Riot Games when I have uh, come a full circle, I have uh, returned to my roots in concept art and illustration while also serving as outsourcing feedback provider on Legends of Terra at the start. But my journey didn't stop there. <laughs> now, I've taken on the role of a VFX art lead for League of Legends, uh, where I'm contributing the growth of the VFX team that uh, makes such an iconic game. The diverse career path has allowed me to explore uh, multiple factors of uh, game development to push the boundary of uh, creativity and uh, innovation. Um, as we embarked on the journey into the world of VFX, we will quickly discover there are as a plenty of tools at disposal. However, it's crucial to ask what role does technical art play in this a uh, vibrant landscape. Let's dive slightly deeper. In the realm of uh, VFX crafting for games, we found ourselves working at uh, the intersection of three essential skills. Particle system, shaders, and the simulations. These skills from the background of uh, creating breathtaking visual effects that enhance the immersive experience of gaming Throughout this session, I will introduce how those three key components overlap with the field of technical art. For example, the early exploration of the Soul Fighter skin line for League of Legends. Uh, on the right, you will find the concept of art. I painted a visual representation of creative direction we aim for. It's a blueprint for the Soul Fighter skin. Um, now, shift your gaze to the left, where you will see the particle system I crafted in the editor. As you compare the two, notice how the particle system get the concept art inspiration. And what exactly is the particle system? 
um, let's lift the curtain and and view what's happened under the hood. Behind the scene, we rely on a clever technique involving animated crowded meshes. These meshes uh, take special shapes like quartz, which are uh, essentially flat planes that always face to the camera. This technique allows us to achieve the illusion of 3D smokes. Now, picture this. All these smokes and the swirls, debris that adds dips and the releasement to our VFX are not 3D objects. Instead, they are texture mapped on those quartz, uh, turning the flat texture into dynamic, lifelike effects. When transparent quartz overlap uh, excessively, even if they use relatively simple shader, it can lead to a drop of performance, what we call overdraw. But fear not, for this is where your technical art knowledge come into play. The art of optimization uh, is our secret weapon in tackling those challenges and ensuring the VFX not only look spectacular, but also run seamlessly. Stay tuned, because in later pages, we will dive deeper into the technical art of shaders, material, and optimizations. For those who play League of Legends and know about our skin line, this example underscores the importance of creative uh, problem solving in game art. I had a task of prototyping a VFX material for weapon look like Soul Fighter, Somatic, Skin Line in League of Legends. This weapon has its unique flaming soul energy effects that drop over the model, featuring layers that overlay the weapon body to save memory budget and ensure efficiency. We needed to sample as few texture as possible. So I used two packed texture that served multiple purpose. This texture not only defined energy's flowing pattern, but also act as mask and provide a UV distortion. This approach allow us achieve a visual effects while keeping the memory use in check. Uh, in the Soul Fighter Somatic, the weapon also use uh, features of outline and the mask defined the range and the covers the weapon model to ensure the outcome. I created a document for the modeling artist. This document serves as a guideline on how to use the visual different, uh, visualize different case of masks. This case is a range from subtle um, gradient to extreme scenarios where uh, parts were fully masked or unmasked. The document introduced uh, specific features of the outline, such as smoothness, hardness, and size. Those attributes explained, visually demonstrated, and documented for the other team members. This attention to detail not only enhanced the visual appeal of the weapons, but also ensure that the art and the technical aspects work seamlessly together it's a testament to the precision and the communication that are the vital in the world of a game dev. In the quest of creating a unique and uh, visual captivating soul energy uh, effect on soul weapons, I made a decision to enhance the visual appeal. Uh, I added extra FX trio alongside my weapon body the vertex color become a vital component, visually indicating the range that could be animated using the shader offset feature. Um, these three examples serve as a blueprint for our modelers. They showcase how to apply the same methods to all the soul weapons for this thematic, effectively standardizing the approach for all weapons belonging to different champions. As you dive into the world of game art, remember that as collective uh, efforts, your individual creativity contributes the larger canvas 
of the gaming experience. What you see before uh, you are uh, the final result of a various feature I prototype for the sole final weapon. These results represent creative and technical exploration. However, these results will be shared with our modeling and the rendering technical art co-workers for a final review. Uh, each artist and the technical expert brings their unique perspective and the skill set to the table. The results I have achieved are just the start point. Our co colleagues will um, reconstruct these features according to their own workflow and the uh, structure uh, of our rendering pipeline. And shaders are also canvas for innovation. They allow you to infuse um, interactivity and motion into your art. I had a shader brainstorming idea that uh, breathes life into some illustration I had painted. Uh, this concept was to animate th these illustrations effectively, turning them into motion graphic. This is not uh, only allow me to explore and validate the concept, but also provide a, a space of creativity without uh, constraints of worrying about optimization. The project ran only on my local device, which means I could experiment freely without need to uh, fine tune it into various platform. During my time at Gearbox, uh, I had the opportunity to work on a boss fight intro cutscene for a character named as Carnivora. Uh, this was a moment with both challenge and excitement for me. Also the first cutscene I contribute to the Borderlands 3 universe. Uh, this dynamic sequence showcased the boss's enormous size and overwhelming power, the destruction you witness as simulated in software like Houdini FX and then integrate it into a real engine. This time, uh, this time consuming custom creation process isn't just for showing off the craft skill. It's a tool to prepare players for the impending boss battle. It's a visual cue that lets them know what they are up against, encourage the player to gear up. Uh, for the challenge ahead. Also, there are two examples uh, I made in Borderlands 3 and the simulated the rigid body physics, uh, then re imported into editor. Consider the destruction effects of a uh, water tower. It's not just about visual satisfaction. This destruction serves a dual purpose, gameplay enhancement, uh, when players demolish the structure, it removes a blocker on their path. It's a dynamic way to open up a new opportunities, create shortcuts or challenges player with their strategic decisions. Player attention, uh, additionally, the ruin the structure no longer demands player's attention. It signals that it won't play a role in the ongoing gameplay uh, ensure player focus on what's more relevant. Um, here's an example of a mixed real-time VFX and how to use technical art to enhance it. Uh, I had the opportunity to work on a boss fight featuring a giant robot in one of the Borderlands 3 DLCs. Uh, this task requested a close collaboration with designers, fellow artists, and engineers. Uh, in this boss fight, uh, within a FPS game such as this one, the art extends beyond uh, visuals. I had to deal with all possible player movement, accounting for different player class abilities, camera angle, and real-time behavior that are hard to predict. For instance, the fire tornado move you see and the top right corner not only creates visual effects around the body, but also sets floor on fire, a crucial gameplay element that causes damage to player. In this case, 
part of the room had a glass window, and uh, that challenge was to ensure the fire particle effects was blocked by the boundary. Transparent uh, glass present a unique challenge requiring communication with the level designer and artists seamlessly to integrate the particle boundary with the room's shape. It's very edgy case. If it's opaque wall, I will mostly uh, just let the particle go beyond the wall since the player won't notice anyway. Uh, so I use the wall space coordinate of particle shader to fade the particle uh, go beyond the glass window. At the right bottom corner, uh, you will see a shader I created. The shader enables players' uh, interaction with the robot's shield. It indicates where the player can cause damage when in first-person uh, camera perspective. Here are two uh, other mixed examples. Real-time VFX led me to explore technical aspect of uh, lighting and shading. Uh, that's where art and the tag come together. Those skills are crucial for creating visual, striking, and immersive game worlds. However, it's important to note those examples are personal projects and haven't undergone the crucial final step um, profoundly impact players' experience. Optimization for performance that will be covered in next page. And uh, this end-to-end -end 3D workflow uh, experience, um, it's an invaluable experience uh, that I had. Uh, I need to do all the modeling, uh, sculpting, and also particle integration, um, as well as composition animation to familiarize myself of the full spectrum of 3D video game art pipeline. And uh, let's talk about rendering pipeline. Ubershader are your allies in creating efficient, visually stunning, and a unified 3D world, a tool that standardized a big part of 3D rendering workflow. Ubershader do just that, providing a single multifunctional um, shader that covers a wide range of features. This means 3D artists can focus on their creative work without worrying whether the necessary features are available. So no more struggling uh, with the complexity of creating and managing an extensive shader library. And this example uh, underscores the technical side of game art, where optimization uh, is just essential as creating stunning visuals. Imagine capturing an in-game frame that reveals the real-time cost budget of every milliseconds of rendering time. This made it possible with a tool called Pix. Uh, my duty includes um, building and deploying game on an Xbox dev kit, a machine used by developers uh, when I work in uh, Gearbox for Borderlands 3. This optimization path uh, means identifying and addressing any performance bottlenecks. I selectively captured a frame that had the potential to cause a drop performance on frame rate, especially during the moment when the camera render uh, high cost elements. These elements might include overdraw of transparency or shaders with complex uh, mathematical operators such as log or using high precision uh, variable type. The goal uh, of the optimization path is to ensure uh, a smooth gameplay experience, maintaining a consistent frame rate of at least 30 FPS. And that's also important uh, consideration that when working on titles destined for multi-platform. Take, for example, my experience at a company like uh, MiHoYo, where we embark on an exciting journey to launch games across a spectrum of uh, devices. Uh, one crucial F, uh, factors we had to keep in mind was 
the shader feature level, this um, understanding that different devices have very um, different capacity and the limitation. This means that certain shader uh, functions may not work or may have different syntax in different devices. Picture this, you are diving into a complex world of customized post-process effect and you are debating uh, whether to use the HLSL or just a visual node-based system to create a shader. So in conclusion, uh, our realm is where art and the technology collide, where innovation and the art collaborate. So uh, if you ever want to connect, learn, or simply chat with me, you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or reach out to me by email. Uh, it's understandable the game development uh, can be challenging, but also incredibly rewarding. So let's have fun. Let the passion drive, and uh, thank you, Gam Mom. I will pass mic to Jin Jin, my co-worker. Yeah, thank you, Ian, for this fantastic presentation. Hi again, I'm Jin Jin. I'm the Tui and Pipeline Technical Artist. Um, today, I'm going to just give a general uh, description about what Tui and Pipeline Tech Artist is. It may not be that fancy, but I <laughs> um, hope you like it. Um, so f before I start, uh, I'm going to just quick share my career path a little bit. Um, so after I first graduated from university, I uh, joined a VR game company as a game designer. So during that job, I got to touch, uh, not, not only need to design the gameplay, but also I need to write some code with C++. And then um, I joined a mobile game company after as a game designer as well. And I was in charge of like character skills design, just like the champion skills design in Liga. Uh, and I need to implement them with Lua. So based on my past two jobs, I figured out um, I may not quite interested in to be a game designer and I found tech art is my interest. So I came to University of Utah to learn the tech art knowledge. Um, so, um, and uh, and then I joined Tencent Games as an intern. So during the internship, I was working on the uh, rigging tools. And uh, that it was that internship that, that opened the gate of the uh, Tool and Pipeline tech art. Like in the past, I was hesitating which uh, tech art check I, I want to focus on. And then I found out, well, it, it's interesting to be a Two and the pipeline tech art. And then um, I joined Riot as an intern as well in um, 2021. And uh, and then I got the return offer of the intern. And then uh, I work on Riot from then on. Yeah, so that's my career path. Um, so next, uh, I'm going to, so this presentation is going to um, break down into three parts. Um, first of all, I'm going to give a taste of what is Pipeline 2 and Pipeline TA. And then I'm going to share some, my understanding of like what uh, what skills are required as a 2 and Pipeline TA. And then uh, I may share some suggestions based on my own experience about how to prepare to be a Pipeline TA. Um, yeah, so first of all, um, the first question is like, what are tools and pipelines? Um, I'm going to give you an example that happens in my daily life to um, to share. So uh, my example is that how many, how many steps for me to get a cup of cold boiled filtered water. Um, so at home, I have a water filled pitcher 
and uh, a water boiler and warmer. So for the first step, I need to fill this water with the water filled pitcher, and then I get the filtered water, and then I need to pour the water into the water boiler and the warmer, and uh, after waiting for a few minutes, I got the boiled water, and then I need to pour the boiled water into the cup, and after waiting for several minutes, um, yeah, I got the cold water. So uh, the whole thing is a pipeline. And as you can see, the water field picture and the water boiler and warmer, they are tools. So like pipeline exists everywhere in our daily life. Um, and also, of course, in other industries. Um, so oh, now that we know uh, what does two and pipelines, what does two and pipeline TA do? Um, one thing we do um, is that we streamline the workflow. So took the take the water drinking pipeline as well. Oh, what happened? Um, like I really feel this pipeline a little pain, painful to me. Like that's why my mouth is dry. Uh, so let's f oh, uh, let's figure. Uh, so the first step for the two end pipeline do in terms of the streamline workflow is that we need to figure out the pinpoints of the pipeline. So as you can see, oh, sorry, I don't know why. It's <laughs> uh, so uh, so firstly, you can see like there are two pinpoints, as I can tell. One is that uh, there are too many steps for me to drink water. Like, why I just want to drink water, why do I need to do three steps? And then the third uh, point, point is that I need to wait between each step. For example, I need to wait for a couple minutes to wait uh, to get the water to be boiled, and I need to wait for 10 to 20 minutes to get the water to be cooled down. So, yeah, after figure out the pinpoints and after figure out, um, we we can determine like what the ideal pipeline is. So the ideal pipeline is that uh, after I pour the water into the into the machine and I can directly get a cup of cool water. So yeah, that's how the water dispenser comes in. Like we we combine the tools together into one, so that we don't need to uh, uh, stand this. Pinpoints. So, uh, I just this is uh, example in our day life. So, what um, what does the example look like in our game development? So, I want to share a quick example about um, that happens very common in our daily work, which is export assets from DCC to Game Engine. So, as we can, as you know, like. The default step is that if we want to export like animations or models from like Maya or Blender into Game Engine, the first step is we export them into a file format which can be acceptable by the Game Engine, and then we import them to the Game Engine. So, can you tell any um, pinpoints about this pipeline? This seems to look quite straightforward, but when it comes to a big team like Liga, it, it becomes a pain. For example, um, when so in Liga we have more than 1,000 skins, so file structure is quite important. If we want to export assets into the file explorer, we must determine that all the assets are well organized. So, uh, as well as like how we import into the game engine, we need to import to the proper places. Yeah, so that's the pain points when uh, it comes to a, a large group. And then we've, uh, 
that can we improve it? Yeah. And so one thing we can do is that we can have a tool to for the exporting, like the tool can determine which file we which folder we want to put our assets on and uh, how we want to import our assets into the engine. So for example, like if we are working on a skin and then the tool can help us determine which folder um which folder to put our assets and how the assets is set up in our game engine. And the tool will do everything for us. Like we don't need to worry about that. Yeah, so that's one simple example about um how we streamline the workflow. And uh, of course, another thing that to and Pipeline TA do is to develop tools. And I believe you already know, I, I understand like why the tool is important. Like when you, if you are do the rigging, I believe um, you may have tried the um, auto rigging tools and uh, it saves a lot of time for you. Um, so here's an example that I did in during the Tencent intern. Um, in back that time, we were working on the facial uh, action coding system, which is a facial rigging system. Um, so without tools, there are many steps we need to do. Um, we need to manually import it, import multiple files uh, into one single. Maya file and we need to manually rename mesh, spine skins, add brand, brand shape targets and so on. So which is painful. So a tool can help us consolidate all the user inputs into a single UI and uh, it will run all the backend stuff underlying uh, automatically for us. So yeah, a tool we we make tools to streamline our workflow and enhance the artist's efficiency. And uh, so to conclude, uh, before I start, uh, I have to state like each uh, different studios or even different projects on the scene studio may have the different expectations on what to and pipeline TA do. So here it's just based on my own experience. So we, um, one thing our uh, pipeline TA do is to define and streamline and maintain the pipelines. Like we need to figure out the pinpoints, we need to communicate with others um, about what the pipe what the pipeline ideal pipeline is. Um and then the second thing is like we develop tools for artists. And the third point is that we need to Soft day-to-day -day problems like bug fixing and uh, uh, consulting stuff with artists. Um, yeah. So next, I'm going to share like what requires skills uh, as a pipeline TA. So, in my opinion, we can divide in them into two two parts. One is the soft skills, another the other part is the hard skills. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the hard skills because I believe you you already know that. Like as a pipeline TA, we need coding skills and we need to be familiar with how each art pipeline is, like how to rig, how to make animations. And uh, we should also be like get familiar with uh, how skin engine works. Um, what I want to emphasize is the soft skills. Like when I why why it's important because like it's uh, as a in a studio we work as a team. So when I was a student, I just uh, developed tools for my own self. But in a studio, it's totally different. In most cases, pipeline TAs serve for others. Like that's why the soft skills are becoming a, a big deal. Oh, sorry, <laughs> important part. So, first of all, 
I want to introduce why oh, why the communication is important. Um, we serve for various uh, various audience, like from VFX artists to animators, narrative people, sound designers, and so on. And uh, we need to communicate them all the time. Like for example, when we make tools, before making tool, we need to figure out what's the pain points uh, and what's the requirement they need for the tool. And we need to come up with proposals with them together. And during making this tool, we are going to share updates with them all the time and we are continuously having conversations with them about the details. And even after make, we finish making the tool, it's not the end. We have to roll out to our audience. Like uh, if uh, we make a tool but no one is using our tools, then the tool is not made. So it's an important part. Also, uh, we need to look for feedback in a long term. Like it doesn't finishing a tool doesn't mean it's the end. We can continue evolving it. Um, so the next the second part is the autonomy. Um, I, will, I will share an example that I didn't do quite well in the past in terms of autonomy, and I hope you can get the idea why it's important. Um, so, uh, I, as you know, like League of Legends have some, have, is published in multiple regions, and some regions need to send have the sensor policy. So our particles, some of our particles are censored um, in some regions such as Tencent region. Um, and uh, but the problem is, th is that sometimes we would, uh, un we would ship unintended sensor particles to other regions. So from time to time, we would got bug report that uh, why the particle looks different from other regions. Um, so due to some limitation, like QA and the VFX artists it have difficulty to figure out like which particle is censored. It takes them quite a lot of time. Um, I didn't rec recognize that like two and pipeline TAs can train to help them to solve this issue. And until recently, they reached out to us that if we can have uh, add a validation to that, like to check all the, to figure out all the sensor particles for them. And I realized, oh it, yeah, there's an opportunity for us to train me. And uh, it only took us like one or two days to add this feature, but it's a big life changing for them in terms of this problem. So if I, if we can identify this, this problem earlier, then we can help them a lot um, and we can save them a lot of time. Um, so yes, yeah, that's why I want to emphasize the autonomy, like if we can proactively seeking out the pinpoint for others before they reach out to us, it would be great. Um, yeah, so usually like if we uh, we saw a repeating patterns or any issues, that, that indicates that there is very, very likely a, an opportunity for us to improve. Uh, so finally, uh, I just want to share some suggestions uh, based on my own experience, like how to prepare to be a tool and pipeline TA. So first thing is that learn to make tools. Um, even if I know you are using the tools from the internet, like they are very fancy, but I think it's quite valuable to make a similar tool by your own self. It's a practicing. Um, also, like, don't worry if you don't have the computer science background. I don't have either. Um, Self-learning is also is always a good approach. And second thing is, 
I highly encourage you to team up to make games together if you haven't already, because in a studio, we usually team collaboration is an important part. Um, I believe you can benefit from this team work experience when you uh, searching for uh, when you're looking for a job. Uh, and finally, don't miss any intern opportunities. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> oh, and let's welcome Scott. Hi, uh, my name is Junliang Zhang. Uh, so I'm currently a 3D, uh, 3D environment artist working at Blaze Entertainment. Uh, so today I will be talking about environment technical art. Um, so before I can get started, uh, let's take a look at the overview of these presentations. So, so first of all, I will talk about a little bit my background and also the career path. Um, so second, I will be talking about what is environment technical artist. Who do, I need, who do I need to work with? What exactly do I need to do? And also the environment, technical art breakdown and some tricks I have learned from Soft of the Wind as a technical artist like two years ago. So, and also I will be talking about how to learn and improve the skills as the environment technical artist as we go. And also lastly, it will be the resources I have found and also some of is from my personal tutorials and breakdowns. All right, so let's talk about uh, myself. So basically, um, my passion in the game industry come from my childhood. I still remember how much I was sitting in front of computers uh, back to the 90s, back, uh, back to the 90s playing very classical PC games, such as like uh, StarCraft, Diablo, and also Command Conquer, and also the Age of Empire 2. That's my favorite games all the time, until, until now, yeah. So, um, when I played those kind of games, I always wondering how they were made in terms of uh, the art and also the gameplay. Or maybe, and how can I could make some cool mods, some modifications, uh, some new weapons, and also integrate into these kind of games. Um, so in 2014, I went to New Film Academy. Uh, they are located in Burbank. And also study uh, game design for my bachelor degree. At the time, uh, I usually went to uh, Norman for the events, for attending events. Uh, I really like uh, their presentation. They teach me a lot. Uh, at the times, I want to be environment artist at the times. Um, after uh, around two years of learning in New York Film Academy, um, one of the, um, so basically in the classroom, I got a call from the local game studios. It is called uh, Three Black Dots. And also they found out me on our stage because at the time I really like uh, creating environment art uh, as uh, my as a career path, so create, I create tons of uh, uh, portfolios, and also I upload to our station. Uh, a lot of people really like that. Um, so Strip Black Dot j just found out me, um, and also they just give me an art test, and now I, I passed, and also I just got an intern at the company because uh, the company, uh, the CEO, really liked my work at the times. Um, they say, oh, your work is amazing on, on station. And also, uh, they really want to hire me as the environment artist intern uh, in 2016, yes. So basically, during the three black dots, uh, I was mainly in charge of the most of the environment artworks. At, uh, I was focused on creating modeling, uh, texturing, and also some shader materials, uh, this kind of work. 
Uh, and also, I was the only environment artist at the company, so basically I had to learn all of the, uh, the skill sets, such as environment art, lighting, uh, technical art, uh, and a little bit uh, rigging. Yeah, that's pretty much what I did at the company for three years. Um, and then, uh, I shipped uh, two games. The first one is called Daron. And uh, another one is called uh, No Way Out, or Daron Tale, which, is, which was a PlayStation 4 VR game. So after shipping these two games, uh, I was going to decide, oh, maybe I'm going to, I want to study some tech art as my next career path. And also, I was looking for uh, the school in the United States, uh, trying to figure out um, how can I to approach that, right? So uh, I just found uh, just only one university, which is called University of Utah, EAE. Uh, EAE means uh, Entertainment Art and the Engineering Program. Uh, they provide a technical art track. So I was fortunate, uh, I got um, I get an offer from University of Utah, and also, I st so in 2019, uh, I just start to study uh, a technical art track as my, uh, for my master's degrees, yeah. So basically, the classes uh, are mostly focused on the uh, research and development for all these kind of things. So everyone, so basically everyone can choose uh, their field. Uh, some people really like uh, character arts, they want to create uh, like a character uh, skin shaders, or maybe some, some people want to create uh, an animation riggings, um, maybe to create uh, like automatic uh, rigging tools uh, with Python. So, and also I should find out, I really want to create uh, like an environment technical artist as my uh, next career path. At the same time, I was doing some procedural content creation, shaders, materials, and also pipeline development. And also, uh, I was fortunate I got hired by Avalanche Software, one of browser games, uh, working under Hogwarts Lexi. Uh, as a lighting artist, and also some uh, some technical art, um, and then I work for uh, Wandering Spirit Games as an environment technical art uh, tech technical artist. Uh, so I will be talk about more in details. Uh, I'll be sharing some uh, what I learned from this project as a technical artist. So after graduate from University of Utah, EAE, so in 2021, I just received an email from Blazor Entertainment. Um, the email says, oh, would you like to work on uh, Diablo 40 uh, as a scene, dev a scene development artist? Yeah, of course. Uh, so this is where I am right now, yeah. So uh, here is some of the projects I have worked. Uh, so first of all, I'm currently working under uh, Diablo 4, um, apparently. <laughs> uh, and also, two years ago, uh, I was working under um, Hogwarts Galaxy, Mo mostly is, uh, creating some dungeon lightings, these kind of things. Um, and also for the shaders as well, yeah. And also, uh, the source of the wind is also like two years ago, uh, I was in charge of the most of the environment technical artists' works at the time. Um, and also, I was an uh, environment artist uh, working under Daron, and also No Way Out, uh, Daron Tale. Uh, these two projects I have created um, during Three Black Dot Studio. So, uh, what is environment technical art does? All right, that's great questions. So, environment technical artist combines uh, artistic, artistic skills with 
uh, technical expertise to create visual stunning worlds and well-performed uh, 3D environments in the video games. So basically, uh, for my daily works, uh, on sort of the wing, I support the procedural content creation, uh, shader development, material creation, uh, scripting, and tools for the pipelines. And also, I optimize the, uh, the scene as well, such as like, oh, I need to uh, reduce the draw costs, uh, I need to bake lighting, uh, I need to utilize all of the uh, substance materials, procedural generation, and also I need to uh, create uh, like a procedural landscape in Houdini and also Unreal Engine 4. Because the Unreal Engine 5, it just came out recently, uh, like, two, like one year ago, yeah. At the time, I was only used the Unreal Engine 4 at the time. So, um, all right, so let's talk about what, who do I need to work with. All right, I mean, for each studio, tech art is, is, is a little bit different, but in my case, uh, I need to identify, uh, so basically I need to speak with the teams. So I need to identify what exactly the team needs, right? Uh, I need to meet a lot of people he, here around uh, in the studios, uh, there are some artists, some uh, art directors, and also programmers and developers, and lastly, game designer, right? So for artists, uh, so I will work closely with 2D and 3D artists, uh, concept artists and animators uh, to bring their creative vision to the project. So I need to help them to understand uh, some technicals constraints and also to optimize assets for the performance. Uh, for the 3D artists, apparently, uh, you don't need, we do have like a, uh, like a polygon limit. We don't need to put like a, uh, create a very simple box with uh, tons of polygons on it. It doesn't really make sense, right? So basically, I need to create some technical um, constraints, some documents, uh, and so basically, to create a guideline for, the, for these artists, so uh, they need to uh, work on this project properly. And also, I need to talk to the art directors. Uh, so in small studios, they don't have a lot of art directors as a direction. Uh, but for larger studios, I need to work with under the guidelines of their own art directors, who sets the artistic direction of this entire project. Uh, cooperation with the, um, and also I need to cooperate with the team, ensure uh, the works align with the project overall vision. So basically, if I work for the uh, uh, Diablo 4, it will be tons of like a monster, very uh, creepy in the heaven, right? Uh, for this kind of uh, genre, so basically, uh, I need to focus on that instead of, uh, well, it doesn't really make sense to just create a very stylized for the Apple 4, right? Yeah, so basically everyone, they need to be on the same page. And also I need to talk to the programmer and developers, and also I need to talk to them because it's very important. Uh, so basically, I need to communicate uh, uh, my artistic requirements, and also I need to work uh, together with the, uh, some programmer and developers to implement a very complex visual effects, shaders, tools, and also to enhance the visual quality of the project. And also, lastly, uh, I will talk to a game designer. I need to... Um, because, uh, I mean, it's very important understanding the game design to create the assets, right? Uh, for example, um, if I need to create uh, some VFX, so some environments, I need to talk to a game designer to see, uh, to identify what exactly he needs. And also, as long as everything um, 
get approval, and also everyone will be very happy about it. Um, so basically, it cooperates with a, a designer, just enhance, uh, will ensure that R enhance the player experience. I mean, ex uh, the player ex experience is the key to make the game successful. Yeah. Okay, so what exactly do I need to contribute as an environment technical artist? I mean, that's a great question. I think challenge is a great friend for tech artists. Because um, if you want to be a technical artist for, for any kind of field, basically every day is like a challenge days. Uh, I always think a tech artist is like a firefighter in the uh, like game studios. Because game studios, uh, basically every day, will happen a lot of unexpected things. Some, someone, oh, the engine, the, the engine just crashed to everyone. I need to find out who checking what is the wrong things when you fix that. Uh, it could be anything. It could be engine things, it could be software things, it could be uh, the visual uh, interrupt, or maybe some file corrupted. So these kind of things, uh, we need to take artists to take a look into it, into it. and also um, the level designer sometimes, yeah, sometimes level designer um, shares have a meeting and also talk about, oh, can I do that? Can I do this? Uh, is there anything, um, performance issues at the times if we, if we make everything very complex? So basically, a game designer will talk to a technical artists to figure out uh, what's the best, what he can, what's the best the technical artist can do for this project. Yeah, so basically Challenger is a great friend for the technical artists. Okay, so for the next things, I will be talking about uh, environment technical artists on Source of the Winds. Uh, That's the project I was a technical artist uh, two years ago. I created. Uh, so let's talk about the, my first challengers. Uh, so for the first challengers, um, I was in the studios, I was in charge. Um, I needed to create a procedural landscape uh, from Houdini to Unreal Engine 4. Uh, that's how I approached. Uh, so basically, today I will be sharing uh, some, sh some knowledge, some, of, uh, some tips, tricks uh, I have learned, such as like very small tutorials breakdown. Yeah. I hope you can learn a lot of from this project that I approached. Uh, that, uh, so on the left, there's um, land, the, the high fields I created in Houdini, and also on the right, you will see the game overall picture, uh, the game overall quality looks like very amazing. Uh, we, we are focused on the, uh, the very stylized uh, environment. So here is a very quick breakdown and tricks for Unreal Engine 5. Uh, I made it in Unreal Engine 4, uh, but actually it's very, it's very compatible uh, to the Unreal Engine 5. It doesn't matter. Uh, let's, okay, so let's take a look at it. So, for, so first of all, um, I create a high field node in, in Houdini. And also there's a few, Parameters you can adjust that you can change the uh, uh, how high you want to be how large you want to be right and also you can change the seat and also some tilings and also the size as well um, for the size here basically I need to take a look at uh, the Unreal website they do have the guidelines for what exactly uh, the setting they need to they need to be, and also you just put a number on it. By default, uh, you will create a very interesting, very, very, uh, like a scene on when you just import uh, um, the landscape into uh, Unreal. So basically, you put a very exact number 
as the website says. And second, uh, I create noise right here. You see here? Uh, oh, you, you cannot see the, my mouse here? Okay. Uh, so basically, for the noise, I just create a noise right here. And also, I use the mask by features so that I want to mask, mask out uh, some of uh, like mountains. I need to be like mountain to be another material. Could be like cliff or rock materials so that I can utilize it in the Unreal Engine 5. And also, I use the flatten uh, to make everything uh, like even on the terrain. So instead of everything is very exaggerated, I need to get more control to these settings. And then I use the mask clear. Uh, just remove the mask from the, the flatten. And then I use the erosion nodes. And also the er erosion is a great tool is, uh, to create this kind of very natural, uh, very organic. You will see some, some rivers, some erosions, some raining. I mean, it's great, but you will cause issues. You will create, you will automatically to create tons of these kind of uh, masks. And also this mask is not what, what I need. I need only just only one I just only need just only one mask instead of a, like a five or six different masks here. All right, so how can I remove that? So basically, I use uh, high field layers, and also I put a I put a into a, a I change the setting to replace, and also I put it into a height, so that I can get rid of all of the mask here. I only need this high mask only. And also, if you, uh, with the middle mouse click, click to the, um, the high field layer, you will see, oh, you just only got, you just get rid of, the, of the, this unrelated mask. You just only just keep one mask at a time, which is the height. And then, I create high field copy layers so that I can rename the mask I want to be so that the mask can expose to, can expose to the uh, Unreal Engine 5. Unreal Engine 5, uh, re uh, the material editor will recognize that immediately. You don't need to worry about uh, anything, like, anything like that. Uh, so basically, here I, I just type in uh, mountain. Yeah. Very simple word. And also, if I middle clock click, and also I will see the mountain uh, below right here in the information of the tab right here, yeah. And then uh, I create another mask by feature layers and also put it into the uh, high field copy layers. I put it into another uh, name, which is called grass. Uh, you can see uh, the mask. So the, uh, you will see the pictures from the Houdini, uh, the red area is uh, everything is called mask. So basically you see the mask out of the ground. Uh, I want to be the grass to be grow over there. Uh, so here I just put uh, the grass name on, onto this note. And also you will see the grass right here. That's very important to keep uh, as clean as possible as you move forward. And then um, here I just create some scatters. So because I want to create some trees, the trees they need to be um, automatically generated onto the, the mask I put right here. And also, here's a very easy way you can get around. So first of all, if you create like a tube, uh, you, and also you just connect to the your scatter nodes, and also you will create um, diff with different angles of this mask. 
and also you will see, oh, the tree is go to left and the right based on the terrain position instead of uh, everything is go straight. I want to be go straight, so here's the, an option is called uh, match the name match. Uh, yeah, I cannot read it, it's too, yeah, too small. <laughs> yeah, hopefully uh, you can see that on that big screen here. Yeah, so basically you just uncheck this box and also all the trees will go straight, only change the Z axis instead of X and Y. And also I just, uh, and also I just put uh, the colors to st stands for, there's a tree right here, right? All right, so uh, for the next things here, um, that's Unreal. Uh, a lot of people use Unreal here, right? Okay, so this is uh, a real engine five material editor. Uh, I create a um, layer blend. So, uh, and also you just change the name to match with the, uh, uh, match the name with the Houdini you did the. So first of all, I create the mountain, mountain and also some grass, some dirt, as uh, and also you just put you can just simply put uh four different colors uh what's that mean is so it's that you can visually see what you did with the mask in origin uh in Houdini so basically uh if you create the mountain, you will see the mask uh, which stands for blue color and also you uh you mask out uh, in Houdini uh, photographs and you will see some orange on the ground. Um, if you feel crazy like a dirt uh, layers in Houdini, and also you will see uh, yellow color into um, in the Unreal Engine 5. So basically, to to test this out with this simple color, to see how that works. If everything works, so that you are ready to go, uh, and also you can create like automatic terrain materials in Unreal Engine 4, and also you can use like grass nodes uh, by using uh, the sample, and also you can uh, generate all the, um, the grass into the Unreal Engine 5. Yeah. And then, Uh, here's another trick right here. Um, in the latest of the Houdini project, I use, uh, the side effects, they just add a very handy note, it's called Unreal Materials. Uh, so basically what this does, actually if, if you import, if you um, combine all the projects together as the Houdini digital assets in Houdini, and also if you, change any settings with the Houdini digital assets, you will see the material that they just lost. Because you don't have the, uh, the Unreal materials hook with the, um, with the Unreal materials, you will lose the, the, of the material texture as long as once you change any settings in the Houdini engines in Unreal Engine 5. So, uh, so basically, um, here is a very small tutorials. So basically, if you create, already create um, instant materials in Unreal Engine 5, you can right click and uh, copy parameters. And then you can paste into uh, the Houdini as long as you create the node is called Unreal Materials. You just paste into a string right here. And also, one thing is just keep in mind, you need to get rid of the red areas on the text you will see right here. So basically, as long as you see anything red, just remove that and also paste it, paste it into strings. This box, everything just worked perfectly. You don't need to worry about anything. Yeah. And uh, that was the, um, the first challengers, right? So I do have the, the second challengers at the studios, which is to create shaders and also materials. I need to create like a tree bending shaders with some swing features. 
that's a high approach um, at the time. Uh, and also, I just got approval at the company, tons of artists. Yeah. Uh, so basically, I create a material function in the Unreal Engine editor. I will talk about this one uh, in, in details for the next slide. Okay, so here, um, basically, uh, the only function I did here is all, it's called shan, uh, san, san cosine, right? San, actually, you can to create this kind of swing effects. So I utilize this, this node to create these kind of animations in the shader editors. So for, for the wave here, I use the object position as a data input. And also, I mask out uh, R and G, which means X and Y, right? And also F mod, and also um, multiply uh, like two, uh, divide uh, like 2000, this kind of value, and also I can to create this kind of wave looking, like a simple grass wind, but it's more advanced like simple grass wind node. And then on the top, I use uh, uh, the time node, so that I can to create this kind of swing effects. Uh, so because sign, they need to work with the time. Without time, it doesn't work eventually. Um, so I use the time, and also I put, uh, you can use a constant, uh, but I, in my case here, I use material collection editor, uh, material collection parameter here, because I can uh, utilize just only one like controllers outside instead of um, uh, adjust the like material editors. So I can adjust it globally instead of individual shaders. And also I add a divide and also and I add those those together and also basically just combine those together and also add a sh uh, the sun behind that. And also add one right here, yeah. And also here, I need to get uh, the Z directions. So for the Z direction here, actually we need to get the mask which you call um, the B, which is the blue channel. Uh, but in this case here, it stands for Z axis. So basically, here for the Z axis, you can um, adjust any values here. You can um, make the tree like up and down because you add uh, the sign before that everything just come back together. You will see the tree well up and down. Um, and then I use uh, the X, Y, Z directions. So basically, oh, I only can change any values I want to be. Uh, so basically, I create a vector three. So vector also, so vector three actually is uh, RGB color. Uh, also means X, Y, Z. So basically, you can change the X values. You will go left. And also, you, you change it to a Y value. You will go left, right. And also, you change it to a Z axis. You will go up. So basically, like a swing effect, dynamically, yeah. And then there's a whole note for the uh, material functions right here. And then you just combine those nodes together. And also, I add per scan local position as a data input, and also put into a local position of the uh, must. Um, the wind blend and also put into a world position offset. So basically, world position offset is like a pixel shaders, or and also you also call fragment shaders. So basically, you just modify of the ver of the vertices of the shaders. You can change that, and uh, after that, let's talk about how I gonna learn and improve as a technical artist skills. Uh, I think 
personal and uh, team development. So basically, just working on a different type of projects to accumulate different working experience uh, to avoid long-term project production on just only single projects. If you work for like first-person shooter games, you only can know uh, like first-person shooter game this kind of uh, workflow. You you want uh, to uh, know any like uh, multiplier uh, or maybe something like World of Warcraft, MMORPG, you will know, you don't know about anything about it, right? So basically, uh, participate in different projects, yeah, that's gonna be very helpful for technical artists to uh, solve any issues as you move forward. And also, technical arts is a teamwork. Uh, they are heavily uh, relies on the cooperation within the technical art team, since everyone is uh, specialized in two different fields. Some people, oh, my main focus uh, is environment art. Some people does like uh, animators. Originally is from animators, and also he want to be uh, like a, like like a technical animators or maybe like TD for cinematics team, something like that. So basically, just working on the, um, with your teammates, you want to make uh, the entire project to be successful. Um, lastly, uh, that's, that's the resources here. Um, that's my art station and also the AD levels. I put uh, tons of uh, free tutorials and also breakdowns onto this website. Uh, feel free to check out my art station for tutorial and breakdowns. All right, thank you so much. That's my art station. Yeah. Hello guys, my name is Chen Hao Wang and I'm a senior staff technical artist at Sony Santa Monica Studio. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation from Norman School and today I'm gonna share some of my work in God of Ragnarok with the students here and hoping to provide some insights into the character tech art. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a technique we introduced in the God of Ragnarok, uh, drawing basic in defamation. To, to achieve high fidelity mesh deformation, the first method that a character tech art thought of was to use their hyper joints. Hyper joints are secondary joints offset from the standard hierarchy, which uh, will translate, rotate, or scale to achieve a hand sculpted effect on area vertices. Uh, there is a GDC talk presented by Jason Park back in 2005 and demonstrate how to use hyper joints to improve the uh, creature's deformation. And in recent years, developers start using an automated algorithm called skinning decomposition to extract the linear blend skinning from a set of sculpted shapes, then use the radio basis function to interpolate the joint's transformations between poses. And there is another technique by Ziva uh, RT that uses machine learning technology to achieve real-time physically-based muscle deformation. The images are side-by-side -side photomographs illustrating before and after muscle simulation. In last project, Kratos muscle deformation is achieved based on post-based deformation. The images present the post-based deformation applied on top of linear blend skinning. Artists accurately model realistic shapes based on poses and we call them pose shapes. And PSD blends them together based on interpolation over the domain of the poses. So PSD workflow proves to be successful in the previous God of War. It sells a realistic look for Kratos. However, in God of War Ragnarok, there are many more characters in the game, and we do not have time to create custom blend shapes for all of them. So we want to develop a standard drawing layout and system for applying deformation corrections. And in this way, we can improve the quality of skin deformations while taking full advantage of fast and efficient linear blend skinning. We prototype a distance-based drawing group to approximate muscle deformation and structure, and we call it muscle drawing group. 
The Greek cubes are the origin and insertion, which are two types of attachment points of a skeletal muscle. The middle fusiform mesh represents the shape of the muscle and is skin to the joint group to visualize the muscle deformation. So there are some important properties of muscles. The first one is a curved fiber structure where you have the origin insertion. A skeletal muscle region describes the attachment of muscle on the more stable bone, and insertion is attachment of the muscle on the more movable bone. Also, there is the property of the volume preservation. When the more mobile bone is brought towards the more stable bone during muscular contraction, the muscle bulge and the worm is growing bigger, which is typical for organic structure for the creatures. Then there's a very important property of dynamics. It helps to bring a sense of rhythm to the creature by adding subtle secondary motion to the muscle, and it's an important aspect of selling a real estate creature created on the computer. The joint hierarchy is straightforward. We have the blue joints represent muscle origin and insertion, and they are used to simulate muscle attachments. With the aim constraints, the green muscle base joint always points towards muscle tip so we can calculate the length of the muscle group. The red muscle driver joint is point constrained by the base and tip, so it is always sitting in between and simulates the muscle movement. The muscle skin joint is a child of driver joint, and its translation and scale are driven by the stretch and the compression of the muscle with the set-driven key. This is the overview of the joint-based uh, joint muscle rig. The rigging system is responsible for mapping the input rig parameters that specify pose to a configuration of the character's animation skeleton. The whole skeleton system is a two-layer structure. The animator can control the animation bones through the control rig, and a second layer of procedure bones is driven directly from the transformation of the underlying animation skeleton. With the linear blend skinning, the animation skeleton contributes to the base deformation of the characters, and the procedure bones are used to approximate non-linear deformations such as muscle bulges and skin slides. The joint-based muscle rig is generated with a modular procedure rigging, so let's say we take the animation skeleton as an input, and running the template scripts can generate the muscle deformation skeleton. And muscle template could be used to generate muscle layout for biped, quadruped, or any kind of creature. We are focusing on the biped muscle template in this project. The muscle joint group is the most basic unit in the system and is used to approximate muscle tissue. The most important function for the muscle joint group is created from attached objects. We need to define the parent bone for the muscle group's origin insertion so they can be connected to the animation bone properly. The last four parameters, compression stretch factor and compression stretch offset, are used to determine the muscle joint's behavior and how much it is scaled or offset with length change. Above that is a muscle component. For example, we have the upper arm muscle component consisting of two muscle joint groups, bicep and triceps. This is an example that we try to manually create the muscle joint group for bicep muscle. And later we can generate it with the arm muscle component in a procedural way. As we can see, there are three locators generated. The upper locator represents origin point and is parent to the first twist joint of the upper arm. And lower one represents insertion point and is the child of the first twist joint of the lower arm. The middle one is the used to position the skin joint at the center of the bicep muscle vertices, so they can be affected uniformly from all directions. The joint placement is the most important thing because it determines the behavior of the muscle and thus affects the mesh deformation. The position of the attachment points for the muscle joint group can be adjusted in edit mode to ensure they are in the correct anatomical position. Then just paint the weights and adjust the set-driven key data if needed. We can see here when the arm is flexing, the bicep muscle is contracting and bulging, sliding up along the bone. And also when you twist the wrist, the bicep is also going to move here, and we call this motion the bicep supination. Okay, so let's look at the deformation test for cradles with joint-based muscle rig applied. We can notice that pectoris major is following the arm movement and chest volume is preserved when the arms are down. And the volume of neck trap is preserved when shoulder struck. Basically, everything is moving together naturally. And when a dynamic joint technique is applied to the, to the muscle, it can reproduce a realistic muscle jiggle effect. And this result is achieved with additional 26 joints skin to the body, and it's corresponding to 26 joint, uh, base, uh, 
26 joint-based muscle groups, which are 14 bilateral muscles. 130 runtime-driven joints are added, and there are no baked joints. So why do we choose the joint-based muscle rigging over the other techniques like the post-based deformation or skinning decomposition? The main reason is the rigging. this rigging method doesn't require artists to model the ground truth shape. This is friendly to riggers who are not comfortable with modeling and to the production that character artists don't have time to prepare all the post shapes. And all we need to learn is anatomy knowledge, which is something that most riggers have already mastered or need to learn further. And this technique doesn't depend on register poses. Therefore, it doesn't have problems with blending. Post-based deformation or skinning decomposition is based on radial basis function for interpolation. They need to have enough post base defined. Otherwise, the corrective shifts will not be triggered correctly. Joint-based muscle rig is based on linear blend skinning, which is compatible to our game engine. It doesn't require much additional work to implement this technique in game compared with other runtime muscle solvers. Additionally, Linear blend skinning is a fast method to compute deformations, and by using procedure joints, it can save a lot of animation costs. The, proce the procedure joints are extremely optimized, so it speeds up the rig evaluation. And last, we want to generate, uh, we, ho we hope to build a systematic and a simple rigging solution, but still can achieve high fidelity skin deformation. This method is based on anatomy and implementing a procedure way, so it could be transferred across characters easily. So the implementation is based on the musculoskeletal system. It is a human body system that provides our body with movement, stability, shape, and support. It is subdivided into two broad systems, the skeletal system and the muscular system. The skeletal system has two parts, the animation skeleton and the procedure joints. The, anima the animation skeleton is a core skeleton that is necessary to describe the motion accurately. You don't need to bother how many row bones are there for twisting system or if the neck loses volume with shrugging shoulders. It is separated from the deformation part. The animation skeleton is a standard and a fix for production. It means all the biped character in the product are sh a project are sharing this skeleton and this allows mocap, animation, or dynamics data to be transferred across characters. And the animation skeleton is a shared asset between the different departments for example, the VFX artists can parent the particle system to them, designers attach the combat nodes to them, and engineers can implement the procedure animation by overriding them. We also have different types of procedure joints in the game. Radial basis, functions, radial basis function joints is mainly used to drive the armor deformation or secondary motion of accessories. Similar to post space deformer, but instead of moving vertices around, we move the joints based on the post space a uh, post interpolation. We can see Thor's shoulder pads sliding on his arms and not appearing to be stretchy if they are skinning to the base character. Set driven key joints is a one dim a dimensional interpolator. Since elbow and knee are hinge joints, so we can use the single rotor value to drive the transformation of the corrective joints. And then we also have joints with different constraints. This allows us to implement some rigging tricks at the wrong time. So in God of War, we, tr we try to apply more procedure joints on top of the animation skeleton. It has uh, following advantages. The first is that the size of animation file will be reduced. Considering the number of animation files in the game, the memory usage in the scene and the overall size of the game will be reduced significantly. Secondly, when procedure animation is involved, these bones can still work normally, or we have to pay the cost of animation blending. Finally, animators like the rig with fewer controllers. Simpler is always better. So imagine the animator do not need to fix the sh shape scene by scene and shot by shot. With procedure joints, the system can handle that automatically. There's one big change compared to the last project is we promoted all the twist joints to be in procedure. The robot setup is implemented based on aim constraint with up vector trying to point to the specified object. To prevent flipping, we use the dot product to adjust the position of the up object, which is a green joint in the picture, and it's a few units above the shoulder joint in the y direction. The dot product is a measure of how closely two vector align in terms of the direction they point. In our case, one vector is pointing along the upper arm direction, and another one is created between the shoulder joint and the yellow helper joint. The helper joint is a few units below the shoulder joint in the y direction. So. This dot product can describe arm rotation in your hemisphere space like a quaternion. 
This is primarily how our shoulders works. The output values range between negative one to one based on that, and then we can drive the position of the up joint with set driven key. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> We also, we also introduced another important bone of human body as the procedural hyper joint, the scapula, which is also known as the shoulder blade. The red edges present the structure of the scapula, which we want to build into the skeletal system of the muscle rig. And it starts from the chromium, extends along the spine of the scapula, and down to the inferior angle. And the chromium joint is promoted to being procedure. It points to the neck joint with the aim constraint. It helps to feed the articulation between the trapezius muscle and the scapula. When the clavicle is rotated, the scapula will continue to orient itself as if it glides over the ribcage. So the quality of deformation is proving, but it is not enough. You probably still notice the neck loses volume when the scapula is elevating. So the next, we're gonna work on the muscular system. We focus on the superficial muscles, which is close to the skin surface. We will learn the anatomy and the function of the muscles so we can attach the muscle joint groups to the bones accordingly and thus achieve muscle deformation. In this project, we apply seven pairs of bilateral muscles to Kratos' upper body, and they are divided into three groups. Trapezius, latissimus dorsi, and teres major belong to the group that contributes to the back skin deformation. The deltoid, triceps, and biceps is a group used for arm and shoulder deformation. The pectoris major is one contributes to the chest deformation. We can flexibly add a single or multiple groups of muscles according to where we want to improve the quality of the deformation. So due to the time constraint today, I will provide a brief introduction to the setup process for the trapezius muscle only. So the trapezius muscle is also called the traps. It is a large muscle in our back. It starts at the base of the head occipital bone and it goes across the shoulders and extends to the 12th vertebra of the thoracis and then it attaches more laterally all along the spine of scapula, goes to the acromion. And if we look from the front, there's a chromium along the latter third of the clavicle. It has three functional parts. So the descending part is the smallest section of the trapezius. It starts at the base of the head, occipital bone, and ends at the latter third of the clavicle. The orientation of the muscle fibers is really kind of unique. The blue dot represents attachments of the muscle fibers to the chromium and the clavicle, and these fibers are in an upward direction to the occipital bone. So when this muscle fiber contracts, it's going to elevate the scapula as shrugging our shoulders. And the traverse part just sits below the descending part, and it goes across your shoulders. The fibers arise from the seventh vertebra of the cervical and extend from the first to fourth thoracic vertebra. They are inserted in the median margin of the chromium. The blue dot represents attachments along the middle of the spinal scapula, and those fibrous orientation grows more at a horizontal level. So when this muscle fiber contracts, they more adduct the scapula, moving it towards the middle line. Ascending part starts from the spinal scapula by the median margin, and it just go down into V-shape in the middle of the back. It helps us bring the shoulder down away from ears. So this is opposite to the descending part. It helps us unshrug the shoulders. And let's look at all these orientation fibers that come from the lateral third of the clavicle, the chromium, middle spine, medium margin spine. Look at these orientation fibers together. So when all these fibers contract at the same time, they result in an upward rotation of the scapula in this fashion, and this is how we lift our hand above our head. So after we figure out the attachment and functionalities of each part of the trapezius, we can start to create the muscle joint groups in Maya. First, we need to locate the origin and insertion of each part of in the animation skeleton space. For example, the descending part starts at the external occipital bone and extends to the seventh cervical vertebra. The occipital bone maps to the head joint and the seventh cervical vertebra corresponding to the neck joint. We can capture the midpoint of the head and neck joint, taking that as the region position. Similarly, the clavicle bone starts from the clavicle joint and ends at chromium joint. Then we pick the midpoint of the lateral third of the clavicle and use that as position of insertion. So with the origin insertion of each part, we can generate the muscle joint groups. And this is the final layout of the trapezius muscle component. It consists of six muscle joint groups that correspond to the three parts of the traps on each side. And then, and then we need to install the latissimus dorsi muscle component. It consists of four muscle joint groups with two parts on each side. 
So this is the deformation with the superficial back muscle add. So one major improvement that the volume of neck trap is preserved when he shrugs. Latissimus dorsa helps to build a connection between the arms and the middle lower back, which makes the deformation look more organic. This is a comparison view between the muscle joint groups on and off. So in general, there are more muscle details in the back. And this is the deformation of cradle's front anterior view. Uh, with the muscle joint groups added, we can see the pecs are moving with arms, and you can feel the volume changing when the muscle fibers are compressed and stretched, and the deltoid muscles help to maintain the contour shape of the shoulder. The following is still the comparison view between the muscle joint groups, groups on and off. We can notice a significant improvement in the silhouette of the chest compared to the before. It feels that the muscles are being stretched by the arms. Additionally, during the cross arm motion, we can feel the chest muscle being compressed due to the change in volume. Okay, so as I said before, the rig is generated with modular procedure rigging, so we can always create more muscle components such as legs and the stomach's muscles. And then we serialize the data into JSON format, so we can save them and recreate them as needed. It helps us maintain the rigs and more importantly, allow us to easily transfer the muscle data between characters. Animation skeleton is created based on a character's body proportion and the muscle components can be procedurally generated based on animation skeleton according to the anatomy. Even though the girl's shapes would be different between characters, we can edit the position of origin insertion or skin joints later. It gives us a really good start point to work on. So in previous God of War, our linear blend skinning only supported four influences per vertex in the game. In God of Ragnarok, since we, in, we introduced more skin joints, we need to increase the bone inferences per vertex to ensure the vertex can be driven smoothly by more than four bones. So we can find that there's a significant difference in memory usage between the four inferences and 10 inferences, which is mainly reflected in the uh, increase of GPU memory. And the depth is another benchmark we use to measure the vertex shader cost. 2 megabytes increase in memory and 0.1 milliseconds in GPU timing is kind of significant. We also need to consider all the other characters loaded as well. We cannot afford to apply high influence count mode to all the assets. So we also add a rig flag to the skin model in Maya to tell the build system how many influences this mesh needs in game and the vertex shader will be applied correspondingly. If there's no flag add, the default four influences vertex shader will be used. Okay, so I'm gonna show uh, in-game cinematics here to wrap this part up. So last but not least, in this project, we also implement a new dynamic joint technique that, and use it to restore this 
important property of the muscle, the jiggle effect. So it is an important aspect of selling a realistic creatures created in the game. But in reality, muscles do not jiggle that much when they are flexed or tensed. They only shake when they are relaxed. However, another body tissue fat jiggles more due to its softness. So we try to approximate creature's fat deformation with jiggle joint system. And Thor's body size makes him a good test case. So this video showcases the jiggle physics makes Thor's belly bounce when he moves. As we can see, the blue bone is in the state before the jiggle tag, and the red bone is drawn after jiggle bone applied. And this video demonstrates how we, uh, how we use the jiggle bones to approximate fat deformations for the bear. It helps to bring a sense of realism to the creature by adding subtle secondary motion to the first. And the jiggle bone has a very low computational cost, so we apply this to the muscle, fat, and anywhere there might be secondary motions. It reacts to the animation and it can save animators a lot of time to create this subtle movement on top of the base motion. And here are some more examples showing the jiggle bones reacting to the animation. We tend to apply the jiggle bones to the giant creatures because the natural shaking of their bodies gives them a sense of weight and math, which can make them feel more imposing to the players. We also use the jiggle joints to drive some small parts like the head fins of Nidhogg and the ears of Yak. It saves the animators time, but more importantly, when procedure joints animation is involved, such as the head tracking system, takes over the animation, this dynamic bone can still follow the head joint and produce smooth secondary motion. So that's all I have today and uh, hope you learn something and get inspired by this kind of new uh, joint-based muscle rigging method or dynamic joint technique. Yeah. And here's my uh, contact info. Yeah, thank you. Hey everyone, so I'm going to be walking around with this cube here, so if you have a question you can go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, I see right here we're getting this cube online, this is a very, <laughs> it's, it was supposed to be made for tossing, but uh, we, don't, we don't toss it around anymore, so. Oh, well that's cool. Um, sorry. Um, well, you were talking about jiggle bone uh, for the bear and larger animal. I use Blender, so is there any way to recreate that without add-on? Uh, you're saying you're gonna recreate that because what? Um, I use Blender, and there's not really a really good way to do this without ex a lot of rigging. Would there be any way to easily do it? Could you repeat again? Sorry, I, I do not understand that. Uh, no. um, is there a way to easily implement jiggle bone into Blender? Into Wonder? Blender. Oh, into Blender, oh yeah. Uh, so this jiggle bone technique is based on the, I implemented that based on Python, and we also have the implementation in the C++, so it's gonna be really easy to implement them in Blender. I'm not a Blender developer, so I'd, I'm not sure the API there, but the algorithm is kind of really simple. It's based on the Spring model. So, and we, we, uh, we, we, we basically, I, I use, for this presentation, it's like from the, my GDC talk, I have the implementation detail there, but uh, I can briefly tell about the algorithm there. It's like we simulate the, the, the point based on the spring model, and we have another aim constraint to, to, to have the rotate bone, to always aim to that uh, jiggle bone, uh, jiggle joint. So, so, it can, so that's the algorithm for that. So you can implement that in the blender. Awesome, so uh, another question for y'all. Uh, this is directed towards all of you so you can all answer. Uh, out of everything that you've worked on, what was the thing that you worked on where as you were working on it, you're like, wow, I, I really made it. This is where I wanna be. I'm very excited to work on this. Obviously, you've worked on a lot of things that you're very excited about now, but what was the first thing that really, really got you excited? All right, uh, yeah. We can share some experience uh, one by one. Would that work? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Sure, for me, um, the experience uh, I worked on Legend of the Ruined Terror, uh, well, it's not technical art related, not directly, right? Uh, as the moment uh, we transfer the level up in game cinematic from the real time uh, VFX to a baked video workflow, um, since the game is already launched. Uh, live, we have to make decision, and we uh, are working remotely during the COVID time. Um, so, a special shout out to my um, art director, Magnus Lehman, who made the brave decision, led us to um, change the workflow from the real time uh, Unity uh, VFX to um, offline baked uh, cinematic workflow that not only saves uh, our performance but also um, blocked our creativity from uh, concept art to VFX. So that is a big challenge but also very rewarding. Yes, that's uh, one of the most impressive experience I had. Uh, well, you want to share some uh, expressive uh, experience? Uh, there's a lot of moments makes me exciting for the project, especially when I work on the God of Wars. A lot of high fidelity characters, like uh, I think Thor is a creature, a character that makes me crazy because he has some really fine deformation for his armors, and uh, that drives me crazy. But also makes me really exciting. And also, I'm not sure if you guys play the God of War uh, Ragnarok, the opening scene. And his cape is is flowing in the in the wind. That that thing is makes I manually actually simulate that part. It's so it's not runtime simulated. It's, it's a pre baked. So we baked that in the Houdini and uh, took some time. But it's really exciting and uh, demonstrates it's a really f really cool moment when he shows up uh, before Kratos. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the most impressive thing that uh, I know I learned is that when I first joined Riot, I get to know that we used a quite um, quite fancy system, which is called uh, SourceArt um, metadata system. I can't tell too much about it, but it's basically a system that help us export assets, uh, organize all the assets through the JSON file and it's that's my first time to know like oh we can organize all things through JSON files. Um and in the past I just uh, organized all the files manually which is quite bad uh, practice. Uh yes it's my most impressive part. Uh Jingdian. Okay. Uh I think uh, for the most impressive parts uh, when I just joined to a blazer two years ago, uh, I think it will be um, creativity freedom. So basically, uh, I was seeing the artists at the times, and also I was working on the uh, mostly is for the loading screen and also the character background and also the campfires. So mostly, uh, when I create those kind of things. Um, I'm not sure if you already played uh, Diablo 4 or not. So basically, uh, after um, this loading screen and also the character selection screen, that's everything I create. Uh, so basically, uh, it just gives me tons of freedom just working on that. Uh, as yeah, it's not a lot. It just gives me a very general art direction, and also I just. just get some inspirations and also just create that, yeah. Hi guys, um, so I am an effects student and so my main software that I use is Houdini and I am interested in learning also Unreal so that way I can take my effects and put them in there. Would you say that the best way or the most standard way to I guess start researching and looking that up would be vertex animation painting, or would you guys typically take your effects and turn them into flip books? I guess it's like how would you start that process on learning um, what is standard in the industry? I guess. That's more like a VFX question. Uh, yes. 
Okay, I can change. Um, if I understand correctly, you want to learn more about how to um, import, export uh, VFX assets from offline software to the real-time software. Mm. So uh, two categories, if it's realistic uh, VFX, yes, we do simulations in offline software. Um, Embergen, Houdini, uh, Maya, Studios Max, whatever. Uh, then we bake it into either Flip box or uh, baked animation, like a rigid body simulation uh, into FBX or uh, sprite sheet uh, texture. Then we re-import it into our real-time engine, uh, Unity, Unreal. We sample the texture if it's a sprite sheet, then uh, reuse it and play it in particle system. So they play uh, as a card, right? You already see that. Uh, always facing the camera. Uh, if it's a um, rigid body simulation, uh, that would be re-imported as a, a baked animation uh, with um, a lot of joints and uh, fragments, but always uh, playing the same uh, animation clips. So that's for realistic uh, VFX. If it's for um, stylized ones, uh, probably you need to draw your own flipbooks. If it's uh, very uh, hand-painted style, otherwise uh, you can use um, uh, hand-painted uh, single texture with some uh, shader tricks like erosion, uh, distortion, or masking that creates an uh, illusion of being animated, but it's actually uh, procedurally, uh, you know, uh, computed by shaders. Have that answer your question? All right. What is next for you guys? I think they're just asking generally kind of what, what is next and what's the, the project, if you can talk about it, what you're working on. But not only that, in your personal, uh, you know, we've had a lot of people come in and say for their personal work, what they're working on, what new tech they're learning, what new program they're learning. So is there a step for you that you see for the future of like, oh, I'm going to start working on this. I'm very excited about this that you can talk about and then uh, obviously technology as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, for me, um, previously when I was um, SME or uh, uh, individual contributor, I focused on my crafting, uh, which is exciting. Now, uh, when I joined the Riot Games, I see tons of talents, um, and I am so inspired by them. So my duty to become a leader is make them to do better art than me, and actually, they already do uh, more amazing artists than me. So my job is like a cheerleader and to support them, uh, unleash their creative potentials. Yeah, uh, Tung Hao? Uh, I, I cannot share what I'm gonna work on or our studio gonna work on, but uh, I can talk about the, the technology we're gonna invest in in the, in the few, few years. I think some it's the machine learning we are actually uh, investigated if you guys go to the GDC or like a C graph is just a lot of topics and uh, papers talking about how how game industry using the machine learning to benefits the game performance and uh, especially in game we always suffers from the memory uh, it's just because we have more powerful uh, GPU so we got a much more powerful computation but the memory always suffers so we want to have the machine learning to approximate our data to help us to simplify the data so we can save some memories. And one, we, if you guys are using the Unreal, or there's some like machine learning deformer that we, we use neural network to approximate the deformations. And we also have some using the neural network to upstream the textures, like because we are pursuing like 8K, 8K textures, but we do not have the disk, either disk size or memory to store those high resolution textures. So we're basically using like 4K or 2K, but upstream them to 8K 
at wrong time. So uh, machine learning is uh, is good stuff. <laughs> I I'm a uh, in the future I may focus on some like web development things like HTML, Java, uh, JavaScript things because uh, I found out like as a pipeline team we not only need to develop tools on DCC but also when more are use are making tools like on the website such as Jira so the um I want to like develop my cell phones their field. Yeah, Junior? Okay. Hi, uh, for, the uh, for the current things, I cannot talk about it because this is under the policy. And uh, but also I would say uh, the machine learning will be the, the futures. Because uh, for the next things, I think I will be using some machine learning for the uh, for the substance designer, because substance designer, if you want to start working on uh, to create procedural textures, you will start with uh, the the high map, right? But creating high map, you will be uh, spend tons of times working on that. But if we want to uh, using the machine learning and also create um, like a tiling texture, and also we can utilize this kind of technology to iterate the texture creating this process fast and also it will be that would be great. Yeah. That's uh, for the next things I will yeah, gonna approach that. Yeah. Awesome. So we have uh two more questions for y'all. Oh one, another thing I want to say is like Houdini, just learn Houdini. Houdini is like a really powerful software. I'm I guarantee you guys we're gonna need more Houdini artists in the future because we need procedure content generation techniques and help us to uh, scale up the production. Uh, hello, uh, first of all, congratulations on the panel, to all of you, of course. But um, my question is, uh, how far that along do you believe the standardization of the USD would be, the universal sin descriptor, as a a translation format because it's the FBX still stands and I was wondering whether there would be a you know templatization and standardization of the USD from now on and I was wondering if you believe this is rather sooner or later that's my question I hope I made myself clear if not I'll try to re re said the question. Mm. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Uh, you're asking about the, f you know, format of, uh, yeah, our document. So far, mm, FBX, uh, OBGR, very commonly used, uh, at least what I see uh, across different studio. But USD, I saw that uh, during the last C graph. And uh, I think, how you can see. So yeah, I think most of Gain Studios now are actually pushing the USD workflow, and uh, I think the it most benefits the environment artist team. And uh, I cannot say that it's just like it, it's benefit. It definitely benefit us because you're using the USD. We are actually building the USD pipeline to help us fast build the data into the game. So, and also it's just, we mainly use that in the environment art, like some static content, a static model, but we cannot integrate, for now, for now we cannot integrate them in the animation pipeline because I think USD is like, is first used by the animation department, uh, visual effect department. They actually share the asset between different different uh, studios and they, for example, they have their, they have in-house animation tools to generate generate animation and then they can bake them to the Alambia cache and they share the Alambia cache as USD and also they share the any data as USD. So we are actually pushing that, but very, very limited to the animation workflow. So because it has really limited support like the constraint, like different constraint or different like, uh, I mean, just Maya data, but it's 
but it's, I, I would say that's also the future because we also have a lot of pipeline engineers to work on the USD. So it's kind of be, will become the industry standard, I think. Yeah. I actually have two questions, if that's fine. So is it better to specialize in something like tool development or pipeline development um, or shaders or um, to kind of have a broad understanding of all of them? Oh, I, I was just wondering if it's better to specialize in a certain type of tech art like pipeline or shaders or tool development, or is it better to have like a general understanding of a few? Mm. To be honest, uh, when we hire people in different studio, uh, I noticed that they always specify the category of <laughs> technical artists, uh, rigging, environment, lighting, uh, VFX, uh, rendering, yeah. Uh, because each field has a uh, very deep uh, knowledge base. Probably it's a good idea to start with one category. Uh, if you want to expand your skill set, feel free to see where uh, you can touch your neighbor, right? Uh, you want to chat about it? Uh, my personal uh, suggestion is to not be the generalist at first, because it's really hard to find the work. and. Uh, Specifically, when we post a job, we like post like we want to looking for character technical artist, or environment technical artist, or like tool technical artist. We are not like looking for generalist. And I, when we review the portfolio, we are seeing a lot of students post their school projects. Maybe they make a game and to prove they know everything, but it doesn't help for it because when we ask him question, we will be really specific related to what we are actually looking for hiring. So you can be generalist, but I still suggest you to be specific at first, and probably you can grow in like a T, po a T, T, T talent, yeah. I totally agree with them. Like usually a big studio may require small specific um, focus area so um, yeah and I agree like usually we a T pose a T shape is a good a good strategy like specify on one field and uh, but also get familiar with the other field is a good trajectory yeah yeah I think uh, for looking for a job so hard skills and also soft skills actually is very important. So first of all, especially if you don't have any experience, you don't uh, get into industry, try just looking for uh, one hard skills. If you want to be like environment technology, just focus on environment. All of the portfolios, they need to be environment. Don't put any uh, thing about like characters, uh, anything like that. So yeah, just keep uh, everything uh, to, yeah, just keep uh, everything into one category you, you, because you don't want to uh, make uh, the, the, the recruiter very confused to you. Uh, and also you can do character, you can do environments, you can do VFX, uh, anything like that. Don't, don't try to be uh, like a 3D journalist because if you want to be 3D journalist, uh, usually you have been in the you have been working in this industry for a long time, so you can be like a journalist. Everyone, um, and also this kind of person actually is very hard to find out. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my last question. Um, is actually about machine learning. You mentioned that it's being adopted in workflows, and I'm just curious about any sort of elaboration on, on how that's being adopted, or maybe like the tra trajectory of that.
so you're asking if machine learning related knowledge can help you looking for job? Uh, I think so. I I think machine learning is the future, but it doesn't mean like you have to know machine learning. But as artists, there is a lot of machine learning related technology will be embedded into these kind of DCC tools. So you probably can use it to help you to uh, make your product much more efficient. So so just. Do not need to say no to them, but I'm not saying you guys need to learn machine learning uh, as a program engineer or whatever like that. But it's just like y try to hug it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, fun fact: uh, the speech note I have written, uh, I used the uh, Chat GPT. We're already on, and that's that's it. Everyone, give them a fantastic round of applause. All right, thank you, folks. Thank you all so much for being here and all your amazing insight. And thank you here, and thank you all at home. Of course, if you want to stay up to date with what we're doing, go ahead and follow us on socials. If you have any questions on what Noman can do for you, go ahead and send us an email at info at noman.edu. And that's it. Until next time, we'll see you. Bye, everyone.